Um, so what I'm going to do today is provide you with a very brief um, vignette of some of the work that I've been doing in Ben Ebert's lab um, that kind of sits at the uh, forefront of a understanding the complexity, the genetic complexity of um, human diseases, in this particular case, human myeloid malignancies, and generating new models to be able to, um, to test drugs. So as you've already heard from Rich Stone and David Sykes, uh, Hematologic malignancies are genetically complex diseases, and they're characterized by uh, this very peculiar subclonal architecture with clonal evolution during disease progression. And although we know a lot about the genetic basis of uh, most of the uh, myeloid malignancies, we know the cell of origin for most of the myeloid malignancies, we're really lacking in models uh, that can recapitulate this kind of subclonal architecture and clonal um, evolution um, that we could then use to test therapeutic agents. And so I do indeed have a slide that shows the uh, TCGA data from AML. We have a similar one for myelodysplastic syndrome where, you know, in 2016, we believe that we know most, if not all, of the genetic drivers uh, the most recurrently mutated genes in both acute myeloid leukemia as well as myelodysplastic syndrome. Uh, but we don't fully understand the biology behind a lot of these. Um, we have our transcription factors, epigenetic modulators, uh, splicing factor mutations, and cohesin mutations. And part of the reason why we don't understand the biology or we don't know how to target them is because we're really hampered by the lack of models that would represent this genetic complexity that we see in patients. And so, you know, historically, the scientific community has used a number of different in vitro and in vivo models to study their favorite disease, their favorite gene, or favorite pathway. Um, in the world of leukemia, we have uh, focused for decades on cell line models uh, that grow on plastic and can be kind cytokine independent if you perturb them with a particular oncogene or loss of a tumor suppressor gene. Uh, we've studied extensively different uh, genetically engineered mouse models. More recently, people have developed stromal scaffold models as well as PDX models. But as you can imagine, all of these models have their limitations. I'll just highlight the fact that there, is, uh, there are very significant differences in the biology of oncogenesis between mice and humans, and particularly in myeloid disease, where a lot of the mutations we're seeing in patients are in epigenetic modulators, splicing and cohesin mutations, for example, that mediate long-range DNA interactions. You could imagine those will have very distinct outcomes in mice versus humans. Um, and even though we can engraft, you know, on a good day, up to 30 to 40 percent of AML samples um, in mice and PDX models, these don't really allow us to customize the genetic lesions uh, that we're introducing um, and are based on the particular patient sample um, that we can get in. And so we set out to develop models that would be a little bit more faithful to both normal hematopoiesis as well as leukemia development. Um, Thankfully for us, we do know the target cell of transformation in most myeloid malignancies, and so we wanted to target human hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, still develop a model that would allow us in vivo to monitor disease progression, um, but most importantly, a model that would mimic this genetic complexity we see in human patients, um, and a model that would be easily customizable, so a way to dial in or dial out particular combinations of mutations. We wanted to develop a model that would be serial transplantable and, uh, most importantly, amenable to pharmacologic testing. And so, for this model, uh, we uh, have decided to use human CD34 positive cells. These cells are enriched for hematopoietic stem cells as well as myeloid progenitor cells. We have relatively easy access to this tissue. Um, and um, using CRISPR genome engineering, a new technology that has really revolutionized the way uh, we um, do genetic engineering and molecular biology these days, we've de developed a methodology to do this in a multiplex fashion to introduce multiple different lesions in these hematopoietic stem cells, transplant them into immunodeficient recipients, um, and follow them over time. And so, uh, this was our first kind of proof of 
uh, concept experiment where we took umbilical cord CD34 positive cells. We introduced Cas9 nuclease, which causes double strand breaks in particular genomic regions, and this is directed by the particular guide RNA. In this case, the guide RNA is specific for STAC2, one of the core components of the cohesin complex, very frequently mutated in both MDS as well as AML. We took the transfected cells, which in this particular case are green, plated them on semi-solid medium called methacellulose that allows growth of colonies out of a single cell, and then did target site amplification and sequencing of these colonies. And what we observed was that, in fact, uh, most of the colonies that we picked had um, modification of the stack 2 locus. This modification was a particular deletion or insertion uh, that was predicted to uh, uh, result in loss of function. It was out of frame, and for this particular guide, uh, these were mainly deletions, but clearly there was a, a wide heterogeneity of lesions that were introduced. Great. So, you know, I, we just discussed that leukemia and myelodysplastic syndrome are not diseases of a single gene and that the whole goal of this um, project was to be able to recapitulate the genetic complexity that we see in patients. And so we um, set out to do this experiment, but now with pools of guide RNAs. And uh, we nominated 11 genes for this pool, which are most frequently mutated in myelodysplastic syndrome and are predicted to have loss of function mutations. This pool also included a couple controls in, um, uh, with, with mutations in splicing factors, um, which are not predicted to be loss of function and that we would not expect, ex expect to see expanded um, in a culture over time. Uh, we transduced our pools into umbilical cord blood CD34-4 cells, cultured them, again, uh, sorted for the green cells, and um, examined uh, the colon examined first populations and then colonies uh, to see if we had any targeting. And so what you see in these pie charts are uh, unique indel types, insertions and deletions that we observed for all of the genes. And so the big picture of the story is that we were indeed able to target every single gene that was in the pool. And as you can see, there is a unique pattern of modifications that was introduced by CRISPR, Cas9, uh, at the genomic locus for each gene. And because I'm going to be using these pie charts for the remainder of my talk, let me just spend a couple of minutes on these. So every single color in these pie charts represents a unique insertion or deletion that's um, um, unique in terms of its genomic location, its quality, whether it's a deletion or insertion, and its size. And as you can see, some guides, uh, such as STAC2 in this particular case, give you a very homogeneous population of cells and the double strand break is repaired in one particular way, whereas guides for other genes can create a really nice heterogeneity of these indels. And this heterogeneity of indels is something that we will be using as genetic barcodes as we're following these cells over time um, as they get transplanted into animals. We next wanted to see whether on a single cell level, we are actually able to target multiple genes um, in a cell. And so again, using the uh, cells that I had uh, described on the previous slide by this time, uh, plating them again on methacellulose, picking single colonies and doing target site amplification um, and next generation sequencing, uh, we saw that about 50% of our colonies were indeed uh, targeted and of those about 80% were targeted by multiple genes. And so what this table shows you are about 40 or so colonies that were targeted. Each column represents a colony. Each row represents a gene that was targeted. Um, and so you see we had a number of uh, colonies that were targeted by um, in multiple different genetic loci. But also, interestingly, it became quite clear that there were some genes, um, particularly I'm going to draw your attention to the ones on the top here, SMC3, ASXL1, and RONX1, which were always um, only targeted in a single allele, so they were heterozygous, as opposed to other genes, TET2, DNMT3A, EZH2, P53, NF1, or STAC2, which were either compound heterozygous or homozygous. And this very nicely correlates with what we see in patient uh, data, where um, 
we never see loss of more than a single allele or um, mutation of a, more than a single allele of uh, SMC3, A601, and RUNX1. And so this zygosity um, that came out of a very short um, um, term assay, this 14-day culture on, on methacellulose, really nicely represents the genetic data that we see in patients. Great, so I mentioned that um, you know, the whole uh, point of this was to create models that we could um, use to follow uh, the subclonal evolution um, in vivo over time. And so we decided to um, use these cells and now go in vivo. And we first wanted to start with the first step in transformation um, uh, in myeloid malignancies. Um, so many of you might have heard of the recent findings over the last couple of years, a number of different groups um, around the country, including our group, uh, identified that um, aging populations, so as we age, we are more likely to acquire somatic lesions in uh, particular uh, genes that are associated with myeloid malignancies. TET2ASXL1 and DNMT3A being the most common ones. And patients who develop this clonal expansion um, of their hematopoietic progenitors are more likely to develop hematologic malignancies in addition to um, other malignancies as well. And so we wanted to first start by modeling this clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate prognosis that hasn't been done before. And so the way we did it was by taking CD34 cells, we introduced a guide RNA for one of the most commonly mutated genes in CHIP, or clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate prognosis, um, injected into mice, and then looked at these mice five months later, at which point we would expect all of the hematopoiesis, human hematopoiesis in these mice to be derived from long-term hematopoietic stem cells. So what we saw was that we got uh, very nice engraftment of our mutated clones as well as expansion um, of the particular indel types. And as I'll show you on the next slide, um, we targeted a number of different long-term hematopoietic stem cells and this unique pattern of insertions and deletions that was found pre-injection was preserved five months in vivo. And so this really argued that not only did we target multiple different long-term hematopoietic stem cells that reconstituted the human hematopoiesis of these mice five months later, but also the fact that we had multiple different uh, loss of function lesions, in this particular case introduced in the SMC3 gene, uh, which were equally uh, able to compete with each other and maintain this heter heterogeneity over time. This is very distinct from what I'll show you as we introduce multiplex targeting and as, as particular clone acquires a secondary or tertiary lesion that allows it to outcompete the remainder of the clones. So in order to do that, um, we um, decided again to take our pools of guide RNAs representing genes mutated in MDS and AML. So these are the 11 genes, introduce them in CD34 positive cells. Um, and in a portion of, uh, of the mice, we also introduced um, some of the most frequently uh, occurring point mutations, which are expected to be gain-of-function mutations, such as FLT3ITD that we heard about earlier today, and MP1 or IDH1. Transplanted these mice um, and then again examined them uh, five months later. And so this is result of one of these experiments. In this particular case, we had 17 mice which were transplanted with these pools of cells that had been transfected with pools of guide RNAs. 10 out of 17 mice had detectable mutant clones five months after um, injection. And um, as you can see, about 70% of these mice had at least two genes targeted. And this was the distribution of the genes uh, that we saw targeted. So most frequently, we're targeting RUNX1, stack to SMC3, NF1, and DNMT3A. Since every single model had a particular constellation of genetic features, every model morphologically was a unique model. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a model that was characterized by an SMC3, um, uh, in this particular case, insertion at an allelic frequency 
of 0.45, and knowing that these lesions only occur heterozygously, basically 90% of the cells contain this SMC3 insertion and FLT3 ITD uh, in the same clone based on the allelic fraction. So what do these models look like? On the top, um, I'm showing you a snapshot of the bone marrow from mice which were uh, transplanted with control or wild type CD34 cells. On the bottom is a mouse that has this SMC3 FLT3 ITD clone present in majority of the cells. These are immature myeloid cells which are staining positive for CD45 as well as MPO. And this is what happened with this mouth over time as we followed it during the duration of the um, post-transplant uh, follow-up. So around three months after transplantation, we saw emergence of this mutant clone, which um, at the time of analysis uh, basically overcame the, the entire bone marrow of this mouse as compared to the wild-type CD34 um, engraftment. Here's an example of another mouse. In this particular case, this is a much more complex model. So this mouse had seven different genetic lesions. And as you can see, based on these allelic fractions, um, we could hypothesize about the very intricate subclonal architecture um, of these lesions, similar to what we see in patients. And in this particular case, we saw not only pockets of immature myeloid cells in the bone marrow, but also expansion of these histiocytic forms, staining for, again, human CD45 and then CD163. And so using this much more complex genetic model, we were now able to ask the question about clonal selection in vivo over five months. And so we're going back to these uh, pie charts that show you unique insertion and deletion patterns prior to the injection and at five months um, after transplantation. And in this particular case, I chose RUNX1 as one of the genes that was mutated in this mouse. And so what you see is that whereas going into the transplant, you have a number of different uh, cells characterized by mainly loss of function insertions and deletions. Um, at five months, there's one dominant clone uh, that um, arises. And this was the case not only for RUNX1, but for every single gene in this mouse. And so in some cases, it was the dominant population of cells or one of the cells from this dominant clone uh, that took over in some cases um, it was a much smaller um, clone present at the time of injection uh, that took over. This analysis, of course, doesn't allow us to tell a difference between drivers and passengers, and you could imagine that uh, some of this clonal evolution for a particular gene is driven by, um, by the other um, genes that are mutated in the particular cell. Great, so we lastly wanted to see whether we could use these genetic models to ask the question we were most interested in, and that was whether we can, whether we can use these models um, and the genetic complexity um, that defines them to then study what genetic vulnerabilities are predictive of response to therapeutic agents. And so we first focused on hypomethylene agents, given that these are the mainstay of treatment in myelodysplastic syndrome. Based on studies from our lab, as well as other labs around the country, there, uh, there's a signal in patients who've been treated with hypomethylene agents that presence of TET2 mutations predicts response to azacitidine and decitabine, whereas ASXL1 mutations um, don't predict response. In fact, patients tend to be more resistant to them. And so we decided to use our model and test this hypothesis um, and see whether our models would fare well in this comparison. And so we uh, did this both in vitro as well as in vivo. First in vitro, taking CD34 cells engineered with TET2 or ASXL1 mutations and treated with azacitidine for 72 hours. We saw a nice genotype-specific response to azacitidine in the TET2 but not ASXL1 mutant clones. We were able to do this, use this very short-term assay to then test other genetic uh, subtypes that were 
included in our pools uh, to see whether we could find any other susceptibilities to azacitidine. And in fact, we did see that SMC3 heterozygous clone also showed um, genotype-specific vulnerability to azacitidine, and that's something uh, that is now being supported in patients um, as well. And then lastly, we generated our in vivo models in grafted mice with TET2 or ASXL1 mutant clones, uh, waited for good engraftment for three months, and then treated them with low dose um, azacitidine for three months on a schedule that's similar to what we do in patients, and then examined the bone marrow and sequenced the bone marrow for presence of indels in both TET2 as well as ASXL1. And what we saw, again, was that there was this genotype-specific response in the mice which had, engrafted, had been engrafted with the TET2 mutant bone marrow, but not the mice uh, which received the ASXL1 mutant bone marrow. We wanted to ask whether this effect was present in the most mature of cells in the bone marrow or, or whether azacitidine was acting on, on more mature uh, myeloid or lymphoid progenitors. And in fact, we saw the effect spanning the full differentiation spectrum in the myeloid lineage um, uh, as well as in the mature lymphoid uh, cells. So I hope that I've uh, convinced you that we are perhaps one step closer to creating models that are more faithful to um, the genetic complexity that we observe in human myeloid malignancies, models that are targeting um, the actual cell of origin of transformation, hematopoietic stem cells and progenitor cells. Uh, that are easily customizable, uh, where you can dial in and dial out specific genetic lesions, and amenable to pharmacologic testing. Clearly, these models have their own limitations. I would say the most important one being the fact that we're engrafting cells into immunodeficient mice, and so the lack of a, an intact immune system and the interaction of these mutant clones with the, uh, with the immune system um, is not, um, uh, not a hallmark of these models. Uh, so I wanted to uh, end by thanking everybody who's been involved, particularly Ben Ebert, who's been a fantastic mentor for me during my postdoc, a number of people in our lab who've been involved in this work, uh, support from people at the Broad Institute, in particular Mike Berger, who's a, an associate computational biologist who um, uh, developed uh, our pipeline for analyzing very complex sequencing data to be able to track the particular indels um, over time as well as uh, Elizabeth Morgan from uh, the pathology uh, department who uh, looked at all of the slides for the mice for me. And I'm happy to take any questions. Great talk, actually. So I have more of, of a mechanistic question. So yeah. you have both transcription and epigenetic factors, right? RONCs1, SMC3, EZH2, and all this. So is there any like literature showing the RONCs1 dependence on SMC3 or EZH2 in, re in regulating the transcription profiles? Because RONCs1 is a major driver in leukemias. And at the same time, is, does SMC3, which is not usually the promoters, but it an enhancer protein, or like it's it folds the chromatin, actually. So do you have any strong target gene dependent on RUNX1, which is highly activated in these leukemias? Uh, so those are both great questions. Actually, in my other life, study cohesin biology. Um, um, so I'm, I'm very interested in the questions you asked. We don't have any particular evidence currently for the genetic interdependence between RUNX1 and cohesin mutations, although in the new um, genetic classification of AML that was suggested by um, Ellie Pepe Benuelli. Um, the cluster of patient samples that are cohesin mutated also have RUNX1 mutations. Um, so there clearly is uh, some relationship there. It's also interesting that cohesin mutations co occur. Uh, with um, H21, but are mutually exclusive with inversion 16. Um, again, hinting at some relationship between the two, but we don't have any, um, any data to support that. Um, I have developed cell line-based models that I'm using to study a lot of biochemistry and then using these models, the CD34 models, for validation, where we are exploring the effects of these, the cohesin mutations on the uh, architecture, on the chromatin architecture, using um, 
high c experiments um, as well as chip seek for particular modifications, but I don't have the answers to that yet. Susanna, you've to shown us that uh, TET2, which is a, a def produces a defect in demethylation, um, is, is uh, correlated with, with response to azacitidine. How about the other demethylating lesions, such as IDH and uh, DNA methyltransferase? Those are great questions. So we haven't tested that yet. And the hypothesis is that the methylation uh, and the um, perturbation of the methylation with these agents may actually affect some of the looping structures in chromatin, as we heard about this morning from, uh, from Brad. Um, so, but we haven't looked specifically at those lesions yet.